throw at them a gun, <laughs> take my gun off. They see a so this is actually a really interesting point. Um, so, so my friend Nathan Kutz shows a, a version of this, which is the Boston Dynamics robot. Everyone's seen the Boston Dynamics big dog. Incredibly impressive four-legged robot. They also have their Terminator-looking robot, the two-legged, super big, terrifying robot. I'm, uh, we're talking about how these robots are now, you know, it's inevitable that they'll be used for, uh, be weaponized. Um, and so in general, everyone knows about the Boston Dynamics robots. Google bought Boston Dynamics, sold it right back. Why? I would argue, and this is a bit, you know, speculative, it's because their generic machine learning didn't work at all for Boston Dynamics robots. Those are, it's a, it's a case study. Self-driving cars, a lot of this is built on, on machine learning and deep neural networks. The Boston Dynamics robot is a physics-based hand-tuned model with control. You cannot just give it a bunch of you know, data and learn how to move a robot. It did not work, okay? Very interesting. So we do have a lot of robotic capabilities, but it is not using the same technology like Google sold it back and you can you can make your own conclusions why they didn't find it profitable to keep Boston Dynamics. Um, and it asks, it forces us to ask the question, what is the next thing that will be possible? Okay, so what are what was difficult 10 years ago is oftentimes not difficult now. And so it makes us wonder what are the things that are truly unique to a human? Okay, and this is actually quite relevant for the young people in the audience. If there is something that everybody can do, I think at some point we will train robots to do something similar. Not always, that's a, that's, a, that's a broad generalization. Like for example, walking and catching and picking up an egg is easy for humans and it's still very hard for robots. But eventually I think um, they'll figure this out. But things that require real expertise where it is not something that everyone can do, not everyone can write the next great American novel. I don't think machine learning will ever write the next great American novel. I would love to be wrong, but I don't think that will ever happen, okay? And so you have to think about what is unique and requires um, an understanding that you can only get through a unique lifetime, okay? Machine learning is never gonna be able to, to build those capabilities. It might be able to make a American novel. Um, there's actually a really fun uh, machine learning paper where they generated Harry Potter fan fiction. It's not too bad. Um, it gets pretty bad. <laughs> it starts off good. I mean, you know, in Hagrid's hut, there were disdainful shrieks of his own furniture. You could totally imagine that happening in Harry Potter. Okay, it's really interesting. Some of the texture they get really well, but their sentences don't all make sense. Okay. Uh, there was a group of MIT that basically created a bullshit paper generator, okay, and they got a bunch of papers accepted and made, you know, fools out of a lot of leading peer-reviewed journals. Uh, I was just seeing um, on Twitter a couple of days ago, someone generated a GAN for all uh, successful um, ICML papers. They basically generated a network trained on all of the thousand successful papers that got accepted, and they can now generate their own papers, you know, pseudo figures and pseudo titles and things like that. Um, so really, you know, like you can create things that are remarkably good at fooling someone who's not paying any attention at all. <laughs> but there are some things that are fundamentally difficult, right? So we live in the world of uncertainty and chaos and dynamics, right? So yesterday we talked about how nonlinearity can give rise to this sensitive dependence on initial conditions. It is very, very difficult to predict where a hurricane is gonna go. With models, with machine learning, from the data we have, there's only so much information and the uncertainty you have amplifies in time. So there are fundamental limits uh, to what information you can extract from your data, okay? I like this one. I think this is really um, kind of a fun example. So for a while, Amazon would suggest what else you might want to put in your basket, okay? 
And so if you bought whatever this person bought, it might suggest that you want ball bearings, magnesium, and gunpowder. Or, uh, you know, in this case, I think this is, this is the material for making thermite, aluminum and magnesium. Okay, so it thinks that whoever is purchasing whatever they're purchasing also wants to make thermite. And it would suggest, um, you know, shrapnel bombs and thermite and all kinds of things. It was very embarrassing because, and this is scary because this means someone was actually, like, this is not Amazon just making this up. Someone was actually putting these together in carts enough that this was in the database. Okay. So, you know, it can go wrong. And I think this is interesting for us to think about what could go wrong. I mean, what could go wrong with, you know, a pervasive machine intelligence everywhere uh, guiding and suggesting things for us. So for example, um, I saw a really interesting talk from a professor at Harvard who took legal case studies from, uh, from the city of New York over decades and decided that they would train machine learning algorithms to basically robo sentence people. Okay, so the judge gets a docket and they get some suggestion based on, okay, well, I've seen this case before, this age group, this crime, this record, you know, blah, blah, blah. What is the chance that they'll repeat offend? What's the chance that they'll become violent and so on and so forth? And they get to decide on what sentence. Is it a fine? Is it, you know, do they set the bail? Do they have to go to jail? Things like that. Uh, and so you can build a machine learning algorithm to basically automate that and give a judge a packet that just shows them the distribution, shows you where this person is, and gives a suggestion about what they should do we have to decide whether or not we are comfortable with that and what are the moral implications of that. Uh, what they found, what was interesting about the talk was this was basically an example of why you should never do this because if you have a historically prejudiced system, you are going to bake in prejudice into all future decisions. Okay, we have to be worried and careful and cautious about this. Um, this is a new slide I just added this morning because this wasn't around the last time I gave this talk. This is, you know, pretty brand new. With these generative models, you can take a static image, uh, in this case of the Mona Lisa, and you can transfer that over to, um, I mean, this one is just incredibly expressive. Right? You can, you can now generate fake movies from, from like one image. That's, that's impressive. So it's constantly a moving target. You know, every day there's 100 new papers in machine learning. Uh, every year there is at least one major advance like this, something we, we didn't think was possible that is now possible. And so, you know, you have to be thinking about what is, what's easy, what's medium, what's hard in machine learning when you're applying this, okay? But there is a big difference, of course, between uh, industry and their resources and their motivations and our resources and motivations as scientists. So for example, if Google wants to train a network for some task that it, you know, spends billions of dollars on, if it gets a 0.1% improvement in its performance, that translates to a tremendous amount of money saved. And so when they, I mean, a lot of these, uh, these companies, when they show you their brand new natural language algorithm or their brand new image classification algorithm, what they don't tell you is that they had a wall of graphics processor units, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000, and they trained the same model with slightly different parameters on every single one of them. And they cherry picked the one that gave them 0.1% better performance, cross-validated because they don't give a shit about interpretability. They just want it to work a little bit better and make them more money. And that's not usually our goal as scientists. And we don't have those resources. We don't have that capability. It's a different, completely different optimization where we live. And I don't think that they often tell you kind of where they're sitting in their optimization landscape. They'll make their code open source. You have to train it on 100,000 GPUs for two months to, uh, to reproduce their, their results, okay? Okay, good. Um, any questions? I have a, yeah, I have a question. Yes. So I think there is also something which is very important is to uh, point out that there are some function evaluations um, whose up to output is not important. So if you like, if, the, if Amazon tells you that you have to buy termite, you don't care. I mean, you don't, I mean, <laughs> if, even, if, even if it's not, in, I mean, 
uh, even if it's a wrong suggestion, the impact of this wrong evaluation is not important. But if you design an airplane and it falls, this function evaluation is important. This is such an important point. I hope everyone heard this. Um, there are there is a there's a whole scale. Um, there's there's many shades of gray about what decisions matter and how much they matter in machine learning, how dangerous a wrong decision is. Um, if Facebook misclassifies a face, not a big deal, right? If Amazon tells you how to make thermite, slightly bigger deal. If an aircraft manufacturer makes an unsafe system and people fall out of the sky, that's a huge deal, right? It would rock the industry. <laughs> trying to be careful. Uh, so, I mean, it's a big deal. There are safety critical applications. So in the in kind of the next part on uh, machine learning and fluids, that's, that's something we absolutely have to be thinking about is that 0.1% cannot be at the cost of all else. I will point out, we don't trust our models now. Like our models, there's no model for how an aircraft is going to fly except an aircraft flying. We have uncertainty in every step, and there's a whole field of uncertainty quantification about managing uh, the, the known issues in our models. And so it's not inconceivable that that will be how we handle this in machine learning too. So I think we have to be asking ourselves why now? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the younger people in this audience kind of, you're, you grew up professionally in the world of modern machine learning. And so, you know, that's just where you, where you come from. Um, a lot of us didn't. A lot of us saw this massive sea change in how we interact with data and how we build models. Um, again, I'm going to oversimplify. This is, again, that ImageNet data set. So why now? It's partly because of this incredible, uh, almost you know, Herculean effort of this labeled training data. It's also because our computational hardware is, you know, incredibly uh, fast and powerful. So I don't know, you know, how many of you track Moore's Law and where we are, but in my lifetime, I've seen the speed of individual cores basically level off because it's hard to make uh, smaller, smaller dies. And so now we have thousands of cores. Okay. And that has allowed us to, and, and these are not great for, you know, tree uh, logic, but it's really, really good for linear algebra. And so we have better computational hardware to train these, these algorithms, which means we can fit larger and more complex models into memory and train millions and billions of degrees of freedom with this large amount of data. Uh, it's also, uh, there's been a huge investment from industry, billions and billions of dollars of investment from industry into open source software, uh, and kind of these community efforts. So there's a lot of things at play that are making this um, kind of as successful as it is. Okay, it's not just neural networks, it's not just GPUs or open source or ImageNet, but it's really this kind of combination of all of them. It did start in uh, 2012 when a group used the ImageNet database and a modern uh, deep learning architecture to destroy previous classification results. Um, and then it was so profoundly better that that's where everyone started pouring in the resources. And in every major uh, task, it's just been getting knocked out one by one um, by, by these deep learning architectures when you have enough labeled data. Okay, uh, good. So I'm about halfway through. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit just about neural networks in general. How many of you feel pretty comfortable with neural networks? How many don't know that much about them? Okay, good. Um, I don't either, but I'll tell you what I do know. Um, so neural networks, you know, I, I do like to say that um, machine learning is not just neural networks. They are not synonymous. There is a world of machine learning out there. I use lots and lots of techniques, and when it's right to use machine uh, neural networks, I use neural networks. When it's not, we don't. I heard a, a respected figure in our field recently say that this is the 21st century and machine learning is neural networks. Um, I don't agree with that, but I will say that there is some truth in that. Like that is where a lot of the opportunity is if you have massive, massive, massive data sets. Yeah. At the moment you are uh, using neural networks, you are looking at an epsilon cubed error between images, for instance. Suppose Google looks here at the faces and tries to recognize the, the people. 
if I would be a mass killer, I would say, okay, person, 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 person. So I would not make the distinction uh, uh, who is who. And, 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 and so if we are in fluid mechanics, we are typically working on much coarse uh, um, distinctions. So we are interested, is, is, we are not interested in a male or female vortex and where it came from and so on. So we are willing to tolerate much larger um, differences. And um, if you, and, and for these type of, uh, um, say, causal classification, other tools are much, um, simpler tools are much more efficient. And I would say for many applications which we have in our community, uh, K nearest network, nearest neighbors, uh, will probably beat neural networks. So, I mean, I, I would not disagree. There are so many other techniques and many of them are better suited to problems than neural networks, depending on, on the problem. Honestly, a lot of, for those of you who have programmed in TensorFlow, a lot of the reason people use neural networks is because it is so easy to use them. They have made it trivial to build a network and train a network and cross-validate it. You don't have to really think about anything going on under the hood. It's easier to build a neural network model than to lurk and project. A lot easier. Yeah. A little bit. I'll, I'll present a little bit of other t of uh, a kind of a dichotomy of networks. But why why are neural networks so popular? So I'm not going to just trash neural networks. They're super useful. They're incredibly impressive. And the major advances in the last ten years have mainly been in neural networks, uh, at least at scale, at industrial scale. Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google scale. The advances have been in these deep neural networks. They are extremely expressive. You can represent, there, there's something called the universal uh, approximation theorem, okay, from the 80s. You can represent any function, no matter how nasty, with a sufficiently deep neural network. And really, that's how I use them. Whenever I have a problem and I think to myself, oh, this is a really nasty function I need to approximate, think Koopman Eigen functions. Remember yesterday? Those Koopman Eigen functions were a mess. They're once you have a Koopman eigenfunction, your world is simpler forever after. But finding that eigenfunction might be incredibly challenging and complex. It might be horrible to write that function down. That's perfect for a neural network. It's a really nasty function, and you like the expressive power of neural networks to represent that function. So anytime you have a terribly nasty function and you have a lot of data, that's actually a great time to be thinking about neural networks. Okay? Uh, and again, it's this arbitrary function approximation theorem. So these are quite old. People have been developing uh, neural networks for over 50 years. The perceptron is one of the earliest ones. People, I, I have a picture of a brain here. They're not called neural networks for no reason. Neuroscientists started you know, understanding how animal brains worked. And they realized that it was this loose confederation of individual processing units that could talk to each other in a network. Okay? And they started trying to understand how this information processing uh, works. And there's still a vibrant community that's kind of at the interface of neuroscience and machine learning. So the NeurIPS conference, this was created by machine learning and neuroscience professors, computational neuroscientists and machine learning researchers. So we're still trying to understand, you can think of it in two ways. We're trying to understand how animal brains work by simulating them in silicon. And we're trying to improve our algorithms by what we learn from biological processing systems. Okay. Now, if you think about what's different between a human or an animal, even like my dog, which is a dynamical system, and an artificial neural network, what are some, what are some key differences? This is why I'm still fundamentally a skeptic. What's different between your neural network and an artificial neural network? So size is a big one. Um, you can plot this log scale, and um, we're probably getting close to like, you know, a bug. <laughs> we're not, our computers are not near the size scale of a human neural network. Um, so size is definitely one of them. But I would say size is, is not, we will someday have a neural network that is as large as a human brain. And I don't think it'll have the capability. So, so, so we are conscious, and as such, we can have a fantasy. We can ask questions. So what the neural networks can only do, they can only make an um, um, optimization or solve a regression problem in, the way, in a well-defined setting. And, 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 and we can have a, a, a fantasy and, and, and can choose our focus of our consciousness. So I think an imagination is a huge part of it. Now, there are actually some very compelling examples 
of deep neural networks that have things that look like dreams and imaginations, right? Google's deep dream are these just wild fantasies that this network, if you just put in random noise into these generative networks, they create dreams. So, but they're not motivated the same way we are. I think motivation is a big part of it. That's your objective function. They are purely motivated by the objective that a human specifies. What are you motivated by? Depends, like I want coffee. Uh, uh, I wanna get through this so I can tell you the next thing. I mean, we're motivated by so many things and so many scales, it's, it's hard to even compare. We also have bodies. I think this is gonna be the fundamental distinction forever. It's gonna be materials. Like I can feel with my fingers. Do you know how hard that's gonna be <laughs> to make something that's even close to as good as a human hand? let alone legs and a heart that lasts for decades. And I mean, the whole system so that you can carry yourself through the world and get this richness of experience, that's gonna be separating us for much longer than the gap between just the raw size of our neural network, okay? Um, okay, good, ImageNet 2012. So these neural networks are based on neurons. Neurons are individual processing units. This is basically just a nonlinear function or a linear function. Okay, it's just a function, some little block function. Uh, it takes an input U and it gives an output Y. You have lots of choices for what this function can be. You can have a sigmoid. This is uh, basically what biological neurons do when you make a decision to spike, there is some input. And based on some probability, there's a sigmoidal response curve of whether you fire or not. Um, increasingly today, we use these, uh, these ReLUs, these rectified linear units. These are, are very useful for kind of building these piecewise functions up in deep architectures. So ReLUs are super popular, but there's a whole zoo of these, uh, these, these functions, okay? And what you do in neural networks is you stitch these together. Okay, so you can take little functions and you can build big functions. You can take one you know, set of, of uh, sigmoids and ReLUs and you can build these very, very complicated cost landscapes for optimization, okay? You can build uh, layers. So you have these, these in intermediate layers, you can have multiple layers. And the real advance in recent years in this last decade is that now you can have very, very large, very, very deep architectures that all fit into your graphics processor unit memory. So you can train all of these parameters with the massive amounts of data you have, okay? Uh, so the deep architectures are, are pretty interesting. Um, and actually, we were talking about this last night uh, over, over dinner. The advances in neural networks have been pretty profound. There are you know, this, this is a zoo of, of neural networks. There's something called the Asimov Institute, and they have this catalog of all of these uh, different network topologies that people are using, and it grows rapidly, all of these designs. But I think we take for granted how important the advances in the algorithms are. So, so um, Peter yesterday was talking about automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is, you know, the unsung hero of a lot of, of these training algorithms, backpropagation. Um, it, there are these fundamental algorithms that have made it possible to train these networks. That is just as important as the network architecture. And now it's pretty much abstracted for us. You don't really have to think about that most of the time when you're using TensorFlow, it just does it for you. Okay, the Atom optimizer is really, really good uh, at optimizing. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of different network architectures. Um, this is again, not at all complete. So convolutional neural networks are really good for images. Okay, um, a convolutional neural network, basically what it does is it has a little, so let's say you have an image, this is a smiley face. And what it does is it takes a little patch of a filter and it slides it across the image, just like you would do in a convolution and it creates another layer. And then you might have another convolution that slides across that and creates another layer and so on and so forth. And this is nice for extracting multi-scale patterns that might be in different places in the image. Okay, that's actually one of the major advances in, uh, in neural networks for image processing is being able to tell who's in a picture even if they're in a different part of the picture. That sounds really trivial to us. It was really hard for computers until convolutional neural networks. So invariance is translational symmetry. 
if I see a picture of a truck, 